All right. I'd like to welcome everyone to our May Lightning Conference featuring Katie Paxton Fear. Um, she'll be presenting today on Hacking API for Beginners. Hi everyone, this is Sarah with Invicti Security. I'm just introducing Dr. Katie Paxton Fear. She is a lecturer and application security engineer, but she's probably more well known for her hobby. In her free time, she um, is a hacker. She's found over 30 vulnerabilities in real software in production right now. She got her start in security thanks to a mentorship at a HackerOne live hacking event in 2019, where she found her first two bugs in Uber, despite it being her first time hacking. After being invited to be a mentor again in Vegas during DEF CON, she realized the privilege she had. And once she got home, she started making videos teaching others how to get into hacking. Since then, she's made over 50 videos on a range of topics explaining beginner vulnerabilities, tools, APIs, note-taking, and mobile hacking. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you're all doing well. Um, today, I'm going to be teaching you hacking for beginners, and we're going to talk about specifically API hacking. And APIs are really great things to hack because actually... They're quite easy in the grand scheme of things. There's a lot of vulnerabilities. There's a lot of like little intricacies, but actually they are everywhere. They are in your fridge, in your mobile applications, in your web applications, in desktop applications. Um, they are literally everywhere. But let's kind of go back a little bit. What exactly is an API? So API stands for Application Programming Interface. And as is the case for a lot of these random acronyms, that doesn't really make a lot of sense on its own. So an API is basically a computer friendly way of interacting um, with the code. So we're kind of used to the idea that, you know, we open up our phone and we see this nice little, you know, um, application. It's got a hamburger menu, whatever. Um, but an API just returns text and that's because a computer can read it. And really, the main advantage using an API is that developers can be a little bit lazy. Instead of creating a mobile app, a web app, a desktop app, they can kind of create the API and just connect it all together. And I said, you know, these look like kind of random text files. So they use something called JSON. Now, JSON is a way of kind of representing data um, in a computer friendly way. So what it looks like, let me just change this to a little pen, is we have these swirly brackets and this is the telltale sign that um, it's JSON, right? This is like the thing you should be looking for. And we have a key here, employee, and then we have the value, which is Max Musterman. Now there's loads of different types of APIs and they all look slightly different. But really what I'm going to be focusing on today is RESTful and GraphQL APIs. Now, often what they do is they return some data directly from the database or some backend logic. So going back to this example here, you know, we might have a database table and that has the word employee and it's got their name and then it has some kind of link to number of items. And we not just have like this original um, like uh, standard record that comes back. We have this kind of... Uh, a collected record, right? So what we're really getting from this particular API is the employee and the items that belong to that employee, whatever they are. Now, down here, you can see GraphQL. Now, GraphQL works a bit differently, and I'll explain that in a second. But again, we still see, you know, curly brackets, and we see this key, and then we see values down here. So we have a key value pair. Now, I mentioned this before, but let's go into a bit more about JSON. So JSON, as I said, starts with a curly brace and it ends with one. Now that's what you want to keep an eye out. Starts with a curly brace, ends with a curly brace. Now, what we have in JSON is we have objects. So objects are contained in these little swirly braces. So this swirly brace matches with this one down here. And then you have other records in there. So here we have the object menu, which contains the sub um, kind of value of ID with file, which contains another object called pop-up, which contains a list. Now, lists are these little square brackets here, and lists can also contain objects. Now, 
really what's kind of important about this is that most APIs, especially modern ones, will return JSON. So it's really important that if you say, I want to get into API hacking, that you can become more familiar with JSON. It's really important. Now, a quick lesson in web development. So when we build APIs as developers, we often create something called CRUD routes. Now, CRUD isn't like a made up um, word because we all hate writing APIs. It stands for create, read, update, and delete. And that's stuff you can do to a resource. So you can delete a resource, you can add a resource, you can update it, you can read it. Now, if we take a look at this little screenshot here, we can see that you know we have an add button. So that's create. We have this way of searching and then reading the data. So you can see the data here, that's our read. Then we have edit, so that's our update, and then delete. So we kind of represent things in this way. And when we say resource, we really mean anything in a web application. Um, it could be users, it could be posts. If we're looking at YouTube, we might have videos, comments. Um, you might have live stream chat. You might have a separate thing between videos and live streams. There's like many ways that you kind of see this in practice and APIs. Um, and I mentioned the word kind of roots, but what is a root? So a in kind of the olden times of web development, each page used to actually exist. So there used to be an actual file called index.php, and that used to be in an actual folder, like there'd be an actual file structure there. And this isn't really true with modern web apps. Now we use something called routing. So when you ask for mywebsite.com forward slash contact, what's actually happening here is you have these routes. Now the route then says, okay, so we have a get request on contact. So we want to load the code in page controller at contact. So that's the um, contact uh, like code, which runs down here. So you see page controller, we see contact. Now, what this is kind of important is that a lot of API routes are automatically generated. Why do we want to see automatically generated API routes? Well, if API routes are automatically generated, it means a developer might have gotten sloppy. For example, you know, down here we have um, we we have this auth route, right? That's automatically generated. The developer hasn't gone in there and said, "Yeah, these are the routes. I've made sure that they are, um, you know, don't have vulnerabilities in them." They're just loading them up, and this happens all the time, and especially in APIs. So when we look at CRUD functionality, we're hoping that that was not generated by a human, that was 100% generated by a machine, because that is something we can hack. Right, so what really happens in terms of like going in back into routing is that the routes kind of tell the web server, oh, you want this kind of um, directory, you want contact, well, I'm actually gonna redirect you to this code here, and then you're gonna run this code. And then this is running a view, um, and a view is basically just plain HTML. So with that out of the way, we can start to talk about RESTful APIs. Now, once again, um, like many things in technology, um, RESTful doesn't really mean what it stands for. So RESTful used to stand for represent representational state transfer. And what that means is basically stuff to do with state. It doesn't really matter that much because it doesn't work the way um, it was supposed to work. What it really means is this kind of pattern here. This is the pattern we want to see. So we have, that's not great. We have our create, our read, our update, and our delete. And what we have here is predictable endpoints. So an endpoint is basically a URL that does something. Like it, it isn't 404, it, it doesn't not exist, it does something, it does something functionally. So we can create a post by doing a post request to posts. We can read a post by doing a get request to posts, so that's the resource name, slash ID. Or if we do a get request to post on its own, it should return everything. Update and delete are a bit weird, and that's because the verbs delete and um, put aren't always implemented correctly. So you kind of see some variation here. But once you see it once, you'll like notice it all the time and you'll be like, yes, I can spot it. And in some cases, um, some web development frameworks will let you specify put and delete 
on like post and get. So that's another kind of neat bypass for you. So the only advantage of this for hackers like me and like you, because you're going to be a hacker after this, you're going to hack APIs, is that it's predictable. If we see this pattern once, we know that it's true for everything. Like we know if we can see create posts, that repost exists. And if we can't access it, that complies with some kind of access control rather than the fact that it doesn't exist. And really what we want to do is we want to find as many of these as possible, because if we can find as many of these as possible, that is what we can hack and that's what we can test. We'll go over kind of the main vulnerabilities, um, but that's kind of the, the broad strokes here. And it also means if we see something like posts, you know, if we're hacking like a forum, we might see replies, we might see users, we might go for some like avatars, signatures, what have you. We might try other types of resources that exist. And again, you know, we mainly find this by poking around. We just load up the website and see what gets returned. That's essentially how this stuff works. Um, and they usually return JSON. So these will pretty much always return some JSON, though there are kind of legacy stuff that may return XML. And then you're going to be talking about this kind of JSON based one. So why is GraphQL different? So I said I was talking about two types of APIs here. That's the first, that's RESTful APIs. Let's talk about GraphQL. So usually when we kind of represent data, we kind of represent it like a spreadsheet. So it's flat, like we have rows and we have columns. So if you've got a user, you'll have the username, the email address, the password, when it was created, and that'll be row one, and then you'll have row two and it'll be a different user. Um, the problem is with this kind of flat design, we don't actually get a lot of the additional information in there. So if we want to make something, for example, like Twitter, we also need tweets. And we need a way to associate a tweet with a user because users have tweets. Now, when we think about these flat structures, really what we create for a single like piece of data ends up being a graph. And that's where GraphQL comes in. It represents data as a graph and these kind of aggregating data structures. So the code for GraphQL is a bit different. I said in RESTful APIs, what we end up doing is we write individual routes or have the computer generate them for us if we're a bit lazy. Um, in GraphQL, we write individual queries. So instead of like saying, that's, that's my API done, you can kind of customize it. Um, and we have two types of kind of data. We have queries, which fetch data, that's our read. And then we have mutations. So that's our update, delete, create. So they're really easy to spot uh, because they use the term mutation and query. So you tend to find them in this kind of structure here where we see GraphQLs, um, query as a parameter or Q as a parameter. Um, but really what we see after that is like mutation and query and that is the sign, like especially mutation. Mutation isn't really used in most other web development apart from in the GraphQL context. And GraphQL has a major advantage to hackers. One, no one's hacking it. And two, it's really easy to enumerate if it's set up in the way we expect it to be. They also return JSON. It's a bit different from a RESTful API. Like it has this kind of, it starts with uh, data and then everything is in this data object. But what you can really do is very easily um, like recall related records. Because again, it represents data as a graph rather than as this kind of flat table layout. Now, if you want more information on GraphQL, because it really is quite in depth and really people aren't actually hacking it, um, you can have a look at my two videos. I've got two videos out on my YouTube channel. Um, one is kind of the basics of GraphQL, what it is and how to hack it. And the second one is like a demo of me actually hacking it and showing how you use some of the tools to actually um, hack an API. So, Testing APIs, I've talked a lot about what they are and how to recognize them and all of that stuff. But let's be fair, you're not here to listen to me talk about how great APIs are. Your hackers, you want to hear about how to hack them. I got you. So let's talk about the first stage of hacking something. Now, in quite a lot of like the defensive context, you already know what's in your API because it's internal. It's your API. You've probably got documentation somewhere stored on like Jira or Confluence or something. You already know what's there. For people looking on the outside, people like me, bug bounty hunters, we have to look 
further. So with that in mind, we have to enumerate them. Now, enumerating APIs is really, really important, especially for testing. It makes sure you know everything in the API. And our goal is really to kind of make predictions about how an API is structured in order to find more about it. For example, I said, you know, we look for CRUD routes. Now, let's say you are like a regular user. You're not probably going to be able to find the endpoint that deletes other accounts that aren't your own because you're a regular user. You don't have that power. You're not going to be able to find on your own like references to um, administrating functionality. So what we need to do is we need to make some predictions about how an API is built and then how to find more. So first thing I'm going to talk about is RESTful APIs because they are far more common. Now, RESTful APIs can be really challenging to enumerate. Now, we need to basically guess the resource names. Now, that's sometimes quite easy because we might know about the app. Now, a lot of times it's quite difficult because we don't really know what's there because we can't see it. For some, it's quite straightforward. So for example, for like YouTube, the first thing you're going to think is videos. You're going to think comments. You might look in the settings and see, oh, there's something about, I don't know, um, having a channel is and channel is separate from user and you can have a business channel and you can, you know, you've got the monetization settings. You end up seeing this kind of explosion of your attack surface. And that's what we want because that's what we're going to hack. So my recommendations here is um, to get common word list names. Now, there is a great um, like list of words on FuzzDB, which has a ton of like discovery methods, common methods, common method names, common resource names. That's a good place to start. Um, sometimes you'll find tailored word lists. Sometimes people have already done this and will publish the um, API. Sometimes you just get given the API documentation, like here you go, have fun. Um, sometimes you might end up writing your own. Now there's some really cool ways of doing this automatically, but honestly, quite a lot you can guess. If you just kind of look at an application, you're like, okay, it's a forum. We want posts, we want replies, we want users. Maybe you do some digging and they have some kind of currency trading. Okay, let's add that to the list. Maybe you see, I don't know, um, something else. You're like, oh, that's a bit weird. I'll look for that as well. Now, no matter what you're doing, you're basically brute forcing. So I'm going to be using Intruder. Now, you don't have to use Burp to do this. And I've got a lot of flack for using Burp in OWASP presentations. Um, but I find the interface much more easier to use than Zap. And it's like, for me, easier. For you, might be harder. Don't have to do it. You don't have to pay for it either. You can just use the free version to do all of this. So for anything, we import the word list, we tell it to brute force the resource name, and then we wait until it finishes and see what comes out. This is not very efficient though. So I wanna talk about Kite Runner. So Kite Runner is a new tool that's only just come out. It's in kind of development. And what it is, it's kind of designed for APIs, specifically RESTful APIs. APIs when built on certain languages will follow certain structures. In Laravel, which is what my demo is built in, I can use, I can provide like an underscore method to any request, and then it will treat it like a post or like a get. And that's something you kind of have to know about Laravel to do. So Kite Runner is this kind of really cool tool which basically does a lot of API recon. And by inferring something about the API structure, the recon can be much more specific. So here's an example here, and you can see all these green lines. So we've got API users. I realize the text is very small. So we have API users. So we know that this endpoint exists, right? We know that maybe this stuff about heartbeat doesn't exist. And then from that, we can start to drill down the, um, like all of the things here, right? So we have API users, grades, we have like, um, different IDs, you know, will bulk update work? All of this, which is like really, really great. And to do this, this is just the, um, the Kite Runner scan. Now, if you're interested in this, I have a whole video on how to use it, how to use it effectively, and all of the uh, commands you can run super easily that you can just copy and paste and have a play with. Now, that's RESTful APIs, difficult to enumerate. Let's talk about GraphQL. So, GraphQL is much easier. So 
GraphQL is designed to have something called introspection. And what that means is that you not only can query um, like the queries that the developers write, you can query anything in like the, the, the graph itself. You can query attributes about the graph. Now, when we put this together, we have this thing called an introspection query. And what that does is that returns everything we need to know to query that um, API. Now, you can do this by looking at the JSON. It's kind of ugly. Um, GraphQL Voyager is really, really easy to use. And it is like very visual. And I like visual things. So how do you actually do this? So this is a big graph. But if we zoom in, we can see this is every query we can run in root. We can get all films. We can get a specific film. We can get all people. We can get a specific person, etc. We don't necessarily know that much about it. So what we do is we go here to film. And then we say, OK, the title is whatever. So you can do, you know, for every film, get the title. OK, not a security vulnerability probably um, something you can do. What if you could edit it, right? What if you weren't supposed to edit it, but you could edit it? And then you can go here and go, okay, to get a specific film, I need the ID, the film ID. Okay, I'll put in one because that's how hackers think. You put in one, two, see if that works as an ID. And then what you get is you then get a choice of what kind of related fields you want to grab. So here we have... Um, the kind of the title, the episode ID, the opening crawl, the director, the producers. So then we can start to build a query like this. So we get all the films. And then from that, we get the films because that's what's being returned. So all films returns a film. We then get the title. So great. But then we start to kind of go into the graph nature of this. So here we have connections to other pieces of data. That's when we start to see this graph structure really take hold. Because now we can make a species connection. And to do that, we need to request a species. And from that, we can request the name and language. And this is what we have. So you can imagine with something like information disclosure, where you don't really know what you're publishing to the API, um, what you're actually making possible. And we can request any information from films. Like, which I just request in the title at the moment. But what if this wasn't a film thing? What if it was a banking app? And you could request your, you know, transactions. That's fine. What if you changed a number and request somebody else's transactions? That is the kind of level of um, uh, like hacking we're talking about. Now, the final thing I want to talk about is like API versioning. So sometimes what will happen is in later versions of API, stuff will get fixed. But for legacy reasons, they might just keep the old API around and not actually fix it. So what you can do is find the same older bugs because they haven't been deleted because the API is still up, right? So if you ever see like API slash version, uh, version three, always check for a version one and see what was fixed between the two. Really useful. So I kind of talked about all right, around this, but what actually are we looking for here? Now, let's talk about the API top 10. Now, you probably heard of the OWASP top 10. You watch an OWASP presentation. Of course you have. But the API security top 10 is a new um, list provided by the OWASP API security project. And what they've done is they've kind of taken this and created a list specifically for APIs because the bugs that affect APIs are ever so slightly different from the bugs that might affect the regular web server. So what I'd like to kind of just talk about is all of these words. Now, these are very, very corporate, and it doesn't always make a lot of sense. You kind of need to explain by a human. Um, so we have this kind of 10 different vulnerabilities, and some of these are like must fix immediately. This is super bad. And some of them are like stuff you can get away with. Like all vulnerabilities, not everything is going to be the like world ending bug, right? So. Let's go through them. Um, now, this is explained in terms of bounty hunters. So if you are hacking stuff, obviously, if you're defending, this is going to be a bit different. But if you are attacking, this is how you do it. So first thing we've got here is API 1, broken object level authorization. APIs tend to expose endpoints that handle object identifiers. That means IDs, creating a wide attack surface level access control issue. 
what that means is that how do you know the person has permission to do something if you're just using ids and just checking oh that id is number one so i'm editing number one you're not actually also checking the user has permission to do that so what should be ha what should happen is you should have an if statement any single time you access like a data source just to check that this is something they can edit so what does it mean? Now, in bug bounty hunting, we call that an IDOR. That used to be in the OWASP top 10. It's no longer. It's now been separated into these ones. Don't worry about it. I'll explain it in a sec. That means insecure direct object reference. Again, doesn't mean a lot. Um, and it's simply the API isn't checking you own a resource before you do something to it. It doesn't have to be your video for you to be able to edit it. That's essentially the bug. Um, and the really the sign of that is IDs. So IDs are used all over APIs all the time. They might be like numerical IDs. They might be UUIDs. They might be um, some other type of encrypted ID. But it's particularly common in RESTful APIs. This is one of the most common bugs in RESTful APIs. And in fact, looking at recent data, um, this kind of vulnerability might have gone up as high as 30% in the uh, last year. So it's really, really common. And well, how do you find it? My recommendation is you see an endpoint with an ID, try removing all of the cookies. So you're essentially logging yourself out, see if it still works. Does it still edit that resource? If it doesn't work, create another user, replace the other user's cookies um, with your own and see if you can edit one of their resources. So that's testing whether or not you can do it logged in and whether or not you can do it from another account. And again, they should never have permission to do this. So then we have broken user authentication. So authentication mechanisms are often implemented incorrectly. That means that something like um, OAuth might have just left some misconfiguration errors. It might be that you can generate tokens without realizing it. it can be a whole bunch of things. Um, and the whole idea here is that you can assume other users' identities either temporarily or permanently. So the idea is you could take over someone else's account. Compromising the system's ability to identify the client, the user, compromise API security overall, of course, if you can pretend to be somebody else and log into their account, it's quite a big security flaw. Um, so what does it mean? Well, the API should have some form of authentication, but doesn't, or it doesn't work. So it might be things like, you can generate authentication for other users. It might be that you can send like um, change a, you know, you're not allowed to an OK and it will still work. It will still log you out and give you that, um, that uh, key. And what are the signs of the bug? Well, sometimes you can find API keys just by Google Dorking. Sometimes you can find APIs which generate some form of token but actually aren't secure. Um, and my recommendation is really kind of recon activity, Google dorking to find API keys, especially GitHub. People commit API keys all the time. It happens. Recon to find internal APIs. This might be a good way of finding like internal um, APIs. And then if you have access to that, then you have even more bugs to look for. And always test login systems, especially the difference between the logging in to the website and the logging into the API, because actually they can be two different authentication methods and be two different tokens. And the API one might be vulnerable, though the logon one isn't. So really important to always test logon, password reset, all of that stuff. Excessive data exposure. Looking forward to generic implementations, developers tend to expose all object properties without considering their individual sensitivity, relying on clients to perform data filtering before sending it to the user. What that means is that the API returns everything, and then it's not an API problem, it's a kind of developer problem of what you want to show. Now, you may only be showing a little bit of data, but actually, in reality, your API is sending back a whole bunch. Imagine kind of a user searching mechanism. You know, you'd expect it to show somebody's username, their like profile link. You wouldn't expect it to show their email address, their password, when their account was created, when they last logged in, all of that stuff. It's all about just too much data from an API. So we call this in kind of um, bug bounty hunting, information disclosure. An API returns too much information when it doesn't need to, and that in can be a security risk. For example, um, personal information. So personal information, especially on the things like GDPR, huge deal, really, really big deal. And what are the signs? Well, 
my advice is always keep an eye out for every endpoint, test them all, see what they kind of return. If you see it returns a lot of information, you should be sitting there like alarm bells ringing and be reporting that because that is key to like really finding these. And primarily how you found these is like API enumeration or pressing buttons. You know, it doesn't have to be like super, um, yes, this is my, this is the way I'm doing API, this is how I'm doing it, this is my methodology. It can be quite casual of like, oh, that's a lot more information that I think it should return. And then here's $500. Um, lack of resource and rate limiting. So, um, oh, I've got the wrong thing on this list. But essentially what this means is that you don't have enough resources to match the demand of the users. So basically you can either uh, DOS an API accidentally because you doesn't limit the amount of things you can do. You can brute force information from the API. That's really useful if you're doing API recon but also useful for attackers to do API recon. So the more API recon you can do, the more you should be thinking, oh, maybe this needs some rate limiting. Um, and this can be really difficult to spot. Usually what tends to happen is people only test kind of log on functionality, but actually if you can break the whole API, that's usually also considered a vulnerability. Um, the best way to find it is like test it, see if it will work. Um, just keep testing an endpoint until it works, like just prove that it works. Broken function level authorization. So complex access control policies with different hierarchies, groups, and roles. That means admin, regular user, guests, they all have different functionalities. They can do different things in the API. Um, and an unclear separation between administrative and regular functions. So should a regular user be able to delete an account? No. Should they be able to delete a video? Maybe. Should they be able to delete someone else's video? Absolutely not, but administrators should be able to, right? And by exploiting these issues, attackers gain access to other users' resources and or administrative functionality. So what we kind of call them is permission level idols. You can do an admin action, even if you're a regular user. Now this gets really complex when you start talking about corporate software, which has many hierarchies. You might have an administrator, you know, Karen in accounts who has um, you know, finance uh, uh, like ability, but she just shouldn't have access to HR. But um, Sally in HR should have access to this, and then um, et cetera, et cetera. Like people have different levels because you might have HR having different to finance, having different levels of access. You as a regular user should be able to do your own pay sets, not other people's, but finance should. You can start to get really, really complex hierarchies, and it's really important to test them. So what are the signs of this bug? Well, any complex permission hierarchy is going to make this mistake. Like it is literally like it, it, it's inevitable, right? It's a mistake that just, it just gets made. It's just a, um, a mistake that people just make. Like it's no big deal. Um, but if you see IDs, you can obviously then test it. You can test different endpoints. What I would do is you have a low permission user and a high permission user and you just test between them. I really like using Firefox containers for this, and I will demonstrate how they work. But essentially, Firefox containers um, allow you to uh, like log on to two accounts at once and then also have both of those traffic through your proxy of choice. Um, Authorize, which is a really great add-on for Burp, can do this, and I'll be showing you a little bit about that. Now, just a quick sidebar here. I want to just explain the difference between API 1 and API 5. So we have kind of these three different bugs that we kind of call broadly IDOs. Um, so one second, I'm just trying to change my little pointer to be like this pointer. Okay. So in a typical IDOL, A should be able to access anything it can that belongs to it, anything that belongs to A, but it shouldn't be able to access anything that belongs to B. Now, if no one's logged in, you shouldn't be able to access anything. It doesn't matter if you are actually A, if you're not logged in, you shouldn't have access to that. Now, when we talk about permission levels, API 5, we're thinking about this kind of structure. C, who's an admin, should be able to access anything A and B do. They're an admin. But A should not only be able to access things that it controls. So it shouldn't be able to access B. So what you might be thinking there is, wait, that typical IDOR looks the same as the permission IDOR. And that it does. It, it, they're very, very similar. And it can be difficult to tell which one you have. 
um, especially when you're like a bug bounty hunter or like a tester where you don't have internal knowledge. Um, the, my recommendation there in terms of what to do is if there's permission level, always test them, like all the, always, always test them. Um, and then if you see like the cred endpoints, test those separately. Mass assignment, binding client provided data to data models without proper property filtering based on a whitelist usually leads to mass assignment. Okay, what this means is that if I have an endpoint that I can change my username or change my email, I shouldn't be able to change my password because it's on a different endpoint. However, on some cases, they just do the thing I said, like they just put in this like default settings and then they can modify properties that actually weren't supposed to be modified in that way. So um, example, you should be able to say, change a forum post, you should be able to edit it, but you shouldn't be able to change the author of it. Like you should be able to provide author ID equals, you know, Bob over there. Um, but you should be able to access, you know, your own and you shouldn't be able to change that, that ID. And that's basically what it's saying. Um, an API will uh, accept additional parameters unintentionally and change them alongside the intentional one. So we intend to edit our post and just change the uh, title, but actually we can also change the user ID because nobody's checking that that's okay. So with that, this really comes when you start to use frameworks when you're developing, and these are really, really common by the way. Um, so often the default settings for developing APIs will include this bug by, by default, it's a feature, you don't have to write that yourself. Um, any Another clue of these might be that you see API calls with additional values, like maybe it says user ID equals one, even though you didn't specify a user ID. So you might be able to change that to two. Now it's owned by somebody else. In terms of finding it as in, like an attacker or somebody testing a website, it's really done through recon. It's really done to like discover additional parameters, see if anything changes. Um, very much the case that this is something that you just have to like try a bunch of times. Security misconfiguration. So if you, like this is quite a simple one, so I'm going to go through it quite quickly. That's just that um, whoever made the API made a mistake that they didn't like accept a setting or they turned the setting off. For example, CSRF, a lot of like frameworks will have it on by default, but actually you can turn it off and you can use your own misconfigured API now uh, because you need to use it for that, that functionality. So in some cases, you can kind of turn off the security features as a developer. Uh, injection. So this is pretty straightforward. You know, we all heard of SQL injection. We all know about RCEs. We know about command injection. This is just that APIs are particularly vulnerable to it. And that's because we don't have necessarily the same amount of filtering. Um, so things like NoSQL are kind of a bit different um, because they're, especially the injection is fairly new. Um, but things like SQL injection is literally because APIs may not be set up with that same WAF filter, that something else might be. Another really good one in terms of injection is actually injecting JavaScript via a mobile app. So on the mobile app, you can send an XSS payload. The like mobile app won't filter that, but it will filter it on the web version. And then on the web version, you can do it, click it, and then the payload will fire. Again, this tends to be more for older applications. A lot of applications will provide um, filtering by default. Improper assets management. APIs tend to expose more endpoints than traditional web applications, making proper and updated documentation highly important. API inventory, deprecated API. Yeah, this is versioning. So don't keep version one up if you're on version three. If people are using version one, they probably need to update because it's probably not very secure. Um, whenever you see versioning as an attacker, you should be looking for higher and lower versions. Higher versions, you might find things like beta tests. Lower versions, you might find that they fixed all the bugs and then didn't turn it off. So that isn't a bit of recon, but actually, most of the time, it's like, I will put, change that four to a three, and then you find bugs. Um, insufficient logging and monitoring. Now, this isn't really that important for it. Like on the offensive side, this is far more for, um, for like regular kind of developers and um, defensive people, which is that if you're in an attack and you don't have logs to find out what happens, 
how on earth are you going to defend against it next time? Like, if they don't have logs, it's hard to stop malicious actors from attacking because they might not know what payloads are being used. They may not know what's vulnerable. This, they may not be able to trace it back to anybody. They may not be able to actually um, do anything with that information. So I want to talk quickly about kind of the tools of the trade here and go over something that like my, my API hacking toolkit. So my first thing that I really like is Kite Runner and FFUF. So these are two tools which can be used for reconnaissance. And for APIs, reconnaissance is a bit different than what it is for regular applications. But it's really important to have a really wide attack surface. So that's the first thing. And that's the first thing I'll do is I'll look and I'll recon and I'll see what I can find and what's actually in this API. What can I see? And this sometimes involves just pressing buttons randomly. Like it just involves, oh, I'm on an application. Well, I'll try and see what the settings page does. I'll try and change my username. What's that actually affecting? What traffic is being proxied? What's coming through? Then we have our HTTP proxy. So the two most common ones are OWASP, ZAP, and Burp Suite. So that's either community or pro. And I don't want your opinions <laughs> on saying that one is awful and the other one is awful. Um, just let people use whatever they're comfortable with. I really like Burp because I think the interface really works for me. I really, I understand it. Um, and Zap, I find really hard to use. And that's simply why I use Burp Suite. Postman. So Postman was originally designed for developers, but it can actually be really useful for exploring really large APIs. Now, one thing I really like is that in Burp, you can have this Postman integration um, like tool which allows you to import like the uh, API endpoints you find from Burp into Postman. And what's really good about it, it makes it a little bit easier to craft requests. So you can see here on this one, I know it's a bit small, but here I've changed, I've added like the underscore method to it. You can also see things like the authentication, how it's authenticating, and you can see the body returned here. You can also save it and come back, especially if you're doing like large APIs and testing really large APIs, it can be really useful. Um, then we have burp add-on. So I use authorize to manually, like automatically check for um, uh, 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 BOLAs and uh, broken function level authorization. Um, and I use inql for using GraphQL because I do a lot of API testing. I really like uh, that. Right. It's demo time. And if you've watched my videos, you already know what demo is coming up. Um, because you've probably seen it before. So we have, this is, there we go. So this is Burp Suite Community Edition. This is the free version. You do not have to pay a lot of money to be able to do this. It is um, completely free. And actually you can do a lot with just the free version. So I'm going to start a temporary project here and start Burp. So this is an API that I've created. I'll actually put it in the chat and it's called Generic University. So what this is, is it is a vulnerable API that I made intentionally vulnerable um, to quite a lot of the API security top 10. And it looks a bit more like a regular application. I'll just put it in the chat. So when I refresh the page, I should be able to see, oh, I forgot to turn off. There we go. You turn off intercept. That's the first thing you do if you use but Turn off intercept. So if we go to the dashboard here, we can ignore pretty much everything on the dashboard. It really doesn't matter. <laughs> like if you have any errors, it will appear here. Um, but you can just ignore this. So what you want to look at is this one. So this is target. This basically shows you it as if the files existed. Now, remember what I said? I said that the files that exist are pretend, like they don't actually exist as files, they exist in the routing. So we can see here that we've got API and we've got users and we've got something in there. We've got a recall to users six. Now, the first thing we have a look on here is we can see that kind of follows a RESTful API structure. So we see API and then we see a resource name, then we see an ID. So the first thing we should be thinking is, you know, that is our first RESTful endpoint. So I'm going to go here, I'm going to go to repeater, and what we want to test is for everything else. So if I go in here and I remove this, can I read every single user? 
yeah, I can. I can read every single user. Fantastic. This would be considered a information, uh, excessive data exposure vulnerability because we shouldn't be able to see every other user, right? We can see the name, we can see the email, we can see a role ID, and we might go, oh, they've got a role ID. Now, let's see, we know API users exist, API roles, and we can see we can also see, you know, different roles. We can see the admin role, the student role, the teacher role. Again, um, this is kind of probably more information than someone who's not logged in has or should have. Uh, so we can just say, okay, that's kind of useful. If we go back here and go back to users, we know that ID one in terms of role is administrator. So if we go down here, we can see user six is an administrator. So we're looking here and we can go, okay, that's the administrator user. We can use this to attack them. We know that this exists and this is a thing we can do. So we've got the get. So let's try the other types of um, uh, different things we could do. We could try and delete him, but let's go for a put request. So this is our update. Now we want to put API users six and we want to copy in kind of what gets returned here. This would be this. So that's our thing. And we just need to tell it that it is uh, content. Application JSON. And you may make sure that whenever you're testing APIs that you do specify application JSON as the content type because um yeah, it is <laughs> it is the number one thing you will forget, and then your code won't your like request won't work. So let's try and change this guy's name. So let's just change it to whatever, random text. Press send. And we can see here we've been able to change it. So that is our, um, from our CRUD functionality that we can know we can read, we know you can update, and we might think, okay, maybe we should delete them. Can we delete a user? But because we're ethical, we don't do this on someone else's account. If we're deleting something, we do it on our own account. So I mentioned before about um, kind of uh, ex like talking about uh, uh, the, um, whatever it's called, uh, what is it? My mind's gone blank. Uh, being able to kind of access data that isn't on the, um, that isn't being recorded. So maybe we might be able to go in here and go to password. You know, can we update this guy's password? You know, will that work? We can go in here and go sorted. Now, will that work? Well, we don't get a no. So maybe we have just changed the password. We don't know, we can't see it. So this would be an example of mass assignment if it works. But again, we can't see if it's worked. What we can do is try and log into the account. So we might go down here, go in here, log in as oh, the password and the username is this one. So, okay, that didn't work. Now, did that not work because maybe this endpoint isn't um, properly uh, like putting them into cryptography or did it not work because it's not vulnerable to mass assignment? We don't necessarily know at this point. If we knew other attributes of a user, maybe we can look on the UI and see there's other attributes. You can um, uh, have a look. Now, we know this is generic university, view your grades. Next thing we might be thinking is, okay, we know you can read users, but can we get, say, grades? And this is kind of what API hacking ends up being, right? We end up sitting here, can we get grades? Yeah, excessive data exposure. Okay, so we can get do the get, let's do the put. So we'll go here, go put, and go take this one here. Go to down here like this. And let's change that 75 to 100 and send the request. And you can see, oh, the put method is not supported for this route. So we've got, you know, reading, but we don't necessarily have updating. And that is kind of how API hacking ends up working. Now, one of the cool things we can do if we want to test for like a lot of these vulnerabilities is.
don't know if I prepared the accounts properly. Okay, so we can log into Colton's account here. And if we use authorize here, so I'm going to turn it on and I'm going to refresh the page, fetch the um, cookies from the last request. Oh, it doesn't like it. Come on. Hmm. Refresh. Okay. In time, we'll just copy them manually. So we can see here the request and response. If I have a look at all of them, I can see that we've got the kind of this modified request and it's got cookie insert thing here. So what we could do is we could log into another user, copy in the cookies and actually test this automatically. So that's exactly what we're going to do. So we've got Colton here and I said I use something called Firefox containers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get another container and I'm going to go to the same website and you can see here I'm not logged in. So I haven't got logged in at all. So I need to just register a new account because I broke the other account. Um, yeah, sure, we'll go for that password. Okay, so now we have two accounts. We have test test and we have Colton here. Now, if we go to our configuration, we can see cookie insert injected cookie or. Now this request here was sent by Colton. So if I have a look at this and I have a look at the original request, I can copy the cookies here like this, copy the cookies, go to the configuration, paste them in here. And now what it will do is it will send multiple requests. So for every single request we send on this account here, it will send it first with a um, first with the original, then with a modified one with our second account, and finally as a unauthenticated user. And with that, we can grab this really, really quickly. So we can see here that you know API users one, we've all, we bypassed it. We can do that. Logged in as one account. Logged in as another account. Um, or even not logged in at all. And this is quite a small application, but on a large application, you could literally like click all of the buttons. You could go here, you could like press this, you know, type in an email address, type in this, press go. And we can start to see, you know, oh, that one was bypassed and it was in force. So what's actually happening there? And if we look down here, we can see the modified request has got one cookie. The original request has another cookie. And then we have an unauthenticated request with no cookie. And all we do then is we just press every button. We just do a bunch of functionality and see what we can bypass. And that is the end of my demo. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. And I'm happy to take questions. So I have a couple of questions here. Shali wanted to know if the presentation notes will get shared after this session. Um, I cannot share the slides, but you are very welcome to rewatch the video and to um, like take screenshots or whatever. I can't share the slides directly because people end up stealing them and representing them and pretending to be me. It's a bit weird. There you go. <laughs> I should say... Uh, here are my social media links if you would like to connect um, while we answer some questions. Alan C. wanted to know if you had any suggestions for other open source tools for REST API testing, like Insomnia, but not losing the advantages of Postman. That's a really good question. I don't know. I tend to use quite a lot of um, closed source tools simply because I'm quite, what's the word? <laughs> I'm quite sensitive when it comes to like a, a user interface I can use and work work with. So I end up using quite a lot of um, like closed source tools, unfortunately. Uh, but I really like things like FFUF, that's completely open source. Um, Kite Runner is completely open source and they form like the basis of my recon activity. Very cool. Arkin1 is asking, do these tools work with gRPC? I have no idea. <laughs> Not got a clue. It's 
<laughs> Levin Cures Makers wanted to know um, why you're not using Burp's integrated browser. Um, so several reasons. One is that if I go into Firefox here, I have Firefox containers. You can also use something called Foxy Proxy, so I can swap between Burp and Zap. So if I want to use Zap, I can like very easily switch to that. Um, and you have this tool here, which can show you all of the cookies that are on a certain um, website, which can be really useful when testing, especially like APIs where you have to have authentication. Um, it's just I happen to have like a good set of um, like tools I like to use. Yeah, the, um, it's interesting. A lot of the people have been asking about hacking and you know how to go about it um, in such a way that you do not get uh, you know in legal trouble. So how do you get into uh, hacking and get invitations to hack people's sites in order to do this um, testing? So I do bug bounties. Obviously, that's not the only way. There's many other like red team activities. There's also penetration testing. So there's lots of different ways of um, like getting into hacking legally. I will say if you know um, the law, so in the law in the UK says the it is only a crime if you do not have permission to hack something. If you have permission, it's not a crime. So what a bug bounty program that you do is get that permission and also get like a lot of them have something called a um like a, a, a mine's going blank uh, a lot of them have like a thing where they'll say yeah we won't we won't do this we won't as long as you follow the rules we're not going to report you to the police i will say some people have had to like deal with this so of course if you're hacking like especially if you don't have permission to hack you should always consult legal advice in your country and if you're not necessarily comfortable with that just don't do it and i will say don't like it's so tempting when you see like a website that you're using it's so tempting to like have it open and be like oh just just test it don't do it it's not worth it it's definitely not worth like you losing your um life to like hacking and, and having to go to prison and you'll never get a job in infosec again like a hundred percent do it with permission. Yeah. It was a scope rules of engagement, et cetera, et cetera. And just to, to recap what you had said earlier um, and to cover Tamika Burston's question, uh, she would like to know how you got into ethical hacking. So I, when I was, um, so my background is not hacking. My background is actually, um, in data science and as a developer. So I worked as a data scientist and developer for like six months after I finished university. And I was walking, getting lunch one day and I realized I hated my job. I really didn't like it. It was a fine job. I was getting paid well. I didn't like it. So then I went and did a PhD. <laughs> so my PhD, the only one, cause this was in like, um, like January, right? PhDs in the UK open in September. I was very far behind like when they actually open. So I had like one choice and it was security um, and machine learning. I thought, well, I do machine learning. I'll just accept the security even though I don't really know much about it. And I didn't really do a lot of security stuff. It was mainly like a way of me doing machine learning. And I got invited to a Hackathon Live event by a friend of mine because I go... Like I did a ton of hackathons at university and they're like, you might really enjoy this. And I told them, no, thank you. They eventually pressured me into it. Um, and I went there for the first time. Now, I had never actually at that point seen a request like in its raw form or a response in its raw form. I had only ever done web development. I knew the concepts, but I didn't know what they looked like. I didn't know how you could edit them. I didn't know that burp existed that zap existed i didn't know owasp existed until i ended up volunteering at defcon uh, to help hand out um like t-shirts and like material for people i was like oh do you know about that owasp i didn't know anything about owasp at the time so i like really didn't know anything about what i was doing and despite that i found my first bug and i was like wow that was a coincidence wow. <laughs> and then i was very fortunate to get invited to another ha hacker one live event and 
when I was there, they were like, I got two more books and I realized, you know, I do data science. I know about statistics. This is becoming a bit of a trend. I must actually be rather good at this. So I ended up being a position where I'm like, wow, I might be able to just do this. And I, that's how I got into hacking. It's completely, I'm completely self-taught, completely learned by just experimentation, actually hacking stuff. I don't even think I ever did a CTF before um, I started hacking real companies. Um, I think we had time for a couple more questions. Yep, yeah, I'm happy to do a couple more. All right, let's go with a um, question from Matt Stadden. Do you think that APIs will be one of the largest attack services in the near future? Absolutely. I think APIs are one of the largest attack services at the moment. Like people don't realize what they're actually exposing in APIs quite a lot of the time because what you tend to see is like the end result of using an API, right? It's like mobile apps, for example. When you actually look at something like, I don't know, you look at something like Twitter, right? This is my actual phone. So what you see there is like the, the things up there, the notifications, whatever. There's a lot more data Twitter holds about you than who you follow and what your notifications are, right? And a lot of that is hidden from you. And, you know, something like Twitter has pretty good security. I have a bug bounty program, probably found quite a lot of these. IoT devices do not have the same amount of um, looking at, uh, uh, like, um, wow, my mind has gone blank. APIs don't have the same, like, IoT devices and the same people looking at them. So, with all of that, you're like, wow, this is a huge attack surface and there's very few people that are actually hacking it. Yep, I would have to agree with you about that. APIs are, without a doubt, you know, one of the biggest attack services, even currently. Um, so you're, we have last question from David Sebastian Barr. And he asks, what's your opinion on whether machine learning and AI will automate a lot of the penetration tasks people are hired to do manually today? I actually did a whole talk on um, machine learning, but essentially to kind of boil down my argument there, there's just not enough data. Machine learning needs so much data. And I mean, you might be a penetration tester. Like, do you want to give people all of your data about how you um, choose to go about a uh, 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 testing something no you kind of keep that a bit a bit more secret because that's kind of your almost like your property right it's like your intellectual property what, what you're actually doing what your methodology is so despite the fact that with something like um penetration testing might be able to be done somewhat by a machine there's just not enough data that people are willing to share to actually produce these algorithms so i don't think it's anytime soon Maybe if there's a big push in the community, but what I do think is a real risk that people don't realize is all the machine learning stuff that actually has gone into production. Like, I don't think we should be worrying about whether or not AI is gonna take security jobs. I think we should be worried about whether AI is safe and secure. And my advice to people, if you're interested in AI and security, go have a look at hacking APIs. They have really unique um vulnerabilities that you know you won't necessarily see anywhere else even in, like in security in general um so that's my advice yeah ha hack apis don't let them hack us first <laughs> there we go. um i guess that's our last question for today and back to anything else that you have to add uh if you have more questions you are welcome to connect with me on social media um i have twitter i have youtube and I have LinkedIn um, with YouTube. I have so many videos on so many different topics. I saw some like about some questions there about like, how do you get into Android? How do you get um, into like hacking with uh, like uh, mobile apps? How do you get, how do you actually set that up? I actually have videos on how to get started with mobile hacking, how to actually hack mobile APIs and how actually you can do all of this together, et cetera. So I really do recommend if you are curious, if I've talked about something to go check out my YouTube channel, like, favorite, subscribe, um, write a comment, I don't know. Whatever the YouTubers all say. 
All right, Katie. Well, thank you for joining us and taking the time to present um, to our audience. Um, like Katie you said, you can connect with her, follow the conversations, continue the conversations on social media. Um, and this presentation will be available on YouTube. So if you've missed something, join late, you want to share it with a coworker, it will be available. So um, and we'd like to thank you guys for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Okay.